Occasionally, I will get frustrated listeners saying, you know, you mention this word sovereignty from time to time, Robert, but you don't tell us how to do it. I'm like, Dude, it's your birthright. You should just it, it, innately know. I know I'm asking too much of you. I know <laughs> we we're lost in a in a haze of of uh, regulations that we might. Well, maybe I can ask permission, and somebody will say it's okay. No, that's not how you do it. How do you do it? Well, the guy I know does it. He's John Bush, and he's one of my friends, one of my heroes, because he's living it and he's teaching you how to do it. He's got a new TV show that's coming out, and you can catch a clip of it. We've got linked up in the show notes today. And you can see it at uh, SovereignLiving.tv and slash the show. We've got it all linked up in the show notes. But John Bush is back. John, my friend, glad to have you on board. Thanks, RSB. It's always good. (laughs) Always a pleasure. Well, listen, man, you have done some things that people will look at you and go, are are you nuts? You've taken on authority. You've taken on the man. You fought the law. And uh, and a lot of times you've actually won. Uh, Yeah, I mean. (laughs) Um, I, it's kind of like, uh, you can beat the, the rat, but you can't beat the ride mm. and, uh, been doing a lot of political activism for several years now. Uh, my lady Catherine as well. And we've kind of feel like lately we've just been banging our heads against the wall. Mm-hmm. So we decided to take a different step and really look in the mirror and see what things we can do to change our lives in order to create a better world. Yeah. And the thing is you're, you're living examples. That's why I like the you, you, sovereign living. It's not a mystery. And a lot of folks have... Uh, some have written books about it, but a lot of folks have uh, like done seminars and charged people ridiculous amounts of money to learn what they could do just by doing it and being it rather than finding out that there's some secret method and a handshake that you have to learn. Literally, it's about living life as our ancestors lived. Yeah, for sure. It's not about filing some paperwork with the Department of Treasury or capital letters on your name it's it's just about living our true nature and uh, trying everything we can do to limit our dependency on centralized institutions uh, from ranging from centralized healthcare institutions food production uh, exploring community defense instead of relying on municipal police departments which harm the people rather than help the people we're just encouraging people to explore living in a different way that isn't uh, linked up with this coercive hierarchical system known as government. Rather, it's based on community and market solutions. And I think we'll be able to find a much better world uh, when we all start living that way. Yeah, root word there, you said coercion. And I think people don't really understand that. I actually saw, just yesterday I was flipping through, and Jan Hellfield, Hellfield, I think is called, he does the Socratic method of questioning folks. He interviewed uh, Bernie Sanders many years ago, socialist uh, senator from Maine, about the idea of the use of force and rights. Do we have certain rights, for instance, to violate somebody else's life by using force against them if they've not violated our rights or you know threatened or actually harmed us? Uh, and he couldn't get Bernie to say, well, basically, no, no, we don't have those rights. And then the next question was, can we delegate rights that we do not have to a government? To do that, which we are not allowed to do. The concept of coercion is something I don't think it's fully understood by the American people anymore. Yeah, it, people just uh, take it for granted. It's present in the back of their minds, but they can't pinpoint it. And I've been in a lot of discourse with uh, progressives and, and folks who do think that government is a good way to organize society uh, in a multitude of ways. Way too many, if you ask me. <laughs> and uh, they never seem to notice the gun in the room, which is always present in the back of my mind. And most Americans, and essentially, you know, a perfect example is the IRS. Most people file their income tax on April 15th, not by choice, not because they even necessarily support where the money's going to go, which mainly goes to pay the debt to the central banks and also fund foreign wars of aggression. But they do it because they're coerced, because the, the threat of violence exists if they do not participate or comply with the unconstitutional law that is the income tax, the IRS code. So yeah, coercion is present in this particular system of governance, this system of organizing society. And through sovereign living, we're hoping to strike the root and and show that that's an immoral way to to run the world. Yeah, but how do we beg our way back to freedom? A lot of folks, or even even the concept of voting our way back to freedom. Uh, the thing is, you know, replacing one so-called bum with another, or one statist with another, or one that's a little less of a statist than the previous one, hasn't proved to be successful in restoring what we would call 
liberty, for lack of a better word, <laughs> that has mm -hmm. to come from, as it was written about the people. What, what does that even mean, we the people? I mean, there's so many concepts that are written in, as if they're historical and legendary, but have no real meaning, at least as the government uses those words today. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, Michael Bolton always says, you know, the solution isn't to to vote in new bums, throw out the old bums and vote in new bums. Mm -hmm. um, but, he, you know, he does the whole nullification thing. And I've actually been reading some articles from the Voluntarist magazine from the 18s and 18s and, and 18, uh, 1980s and, and 1990s. And it talks about how we can practice individual nullification in our own daily lives when there's an unconstitutional or immoral law. And, you know, I think the political system in many ways is is rigged to support the ruling class or those who are in power at the time, and it completely neglects the rights, the property, and the lives of the masses and of the people. Even going back to the U.S. Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, many people fail to recognize that the U.S. Constitution actually took away much freedom that was present before the U.S. Constitution was uh, signed. Uh, on top of that, a lot of people didn't even have a say in the way that they were to be governed. So I think if we strike the root, which in my opinion, the root cause of most of the problems that we find as, as human beings on this earth, uh, which is a centralized system that has a monopoly on the quote-unquote legitimate use of force, that can use coercion, that can initiate aggression against peaceful people who have done no harm, I think until we strike that root and notice that that is causing a lot of ills in society, then we'll just continue in a cycle of revolution where it's one group of people in power and and the other group of people don't like that they're in power, so they decide to take power for themselves, but they turn into the same jerks that they just overthrew. And that's what history has been, so I think we should try something different. It's about, it's about time to at least experiment in some other ways. Yeah, we're talking with John Bush, and uh, SovereignLiving.tv is one of the websites I want you to check out. It's linked up in the show notes today. We've we've both spoken at a number of the uh, Tenth Amendment Center's nullification uh, conferences. You mentioned the concept of nullification, Michael Bolden, and the Tenth Amendment Center. I also want to tell you that, uh, John, if you don't know this, also hosts Rise Up Radio, and RiseUpRadio.com is the link. How often does the show go on and when? I know it's super early. It's it's super early. I'm I'm not a morning guy, but I'm doing a morning show. It's every Monday through Friday from seven to eight a.m. Central Time, mm -hmm. and it can be heard on LRN.FM. It's a Liberty Radio Network. LRN.FM. And you got me early, up early, early, early to do that. Not many people can do that, and you did. So I, <laughs> that's just how much it's not I like easy. It. <laughs> well, listen, John, th there's so much to discuss and the, the putting it into play. You know, we can talk about it and people love to debate about it. And you see blogs written by you see on the social networks, people arguing about it. But among the many things I love about you and your wife is that y it isn't just a, a mental discourse discussion. It's literally how do we put these principles into play? And you've lived your life as an example and some people are frightened of that example. Even though you are nonviolent and you're standing up to those folks that have the, the weapons, the guns, and they believe, they perceive they have some sort of delegated authority to, to, to visit violence upon you. So where mm -hmm. did this, can I ask, I mean, is it even possible to find it? Where did this, uh, uh, is courage the right word? I mean, so many people would rather cower in fear and, and keep their head down and not stand up. But somewhere in you, you said, no, I got to stand up. Yeah, I mean, there's still fear present in my mind and in my heart. Um, I mean, almost every day, especially when I'm traveling around in my automobile. That's usually the interaction that I that I have with the state when I'm not going out and, and finding them, uh, like with the Peaceful Streets Project doing cop watches. I hadn't done that in a while since I got arrested uh, a couple times ago because it's not good to be taken away from my family. But there is that constant fear. But the, the way I see it is that I live a moral life. I'm a good person. The activities that I engage in are noble and virtuous. I'm trying to grow food and teach others to grow food and helping supply families with uh, their own chicken starter setups. We just launched a nonprofit, the Center for Natural Living. We're doing a lot of philanthropy going into low-income neighborhoods and, and helping them uh, find the magical gift of natural health, linking them up with nice. uh, uh, health care professionals, as well as getting them fluoride water filters so they don't have have to give their newborns fluoridated water, which even the CDC says is wrong. Mm -hmm. We're doing chickens down here. I'm not even sure if we're following all the regulations, but we're just doing what's right because it's not about what's legal or illegal. It's about what's right and wrong, what's moral and immoral. So should I come under fire or be tossed in a cage by, because I'm, I have 100 chickens out back and because I'm supplying the community with eggs, then I think it would serve to undermine the legitimacy that the state has. And I know that it'll 
it'll be quick that my community will be there for me but it's just so silly that it's even a topic of discussion that someone could be locked up because they're supplying raw milk to their community for example or because uh they're uh, not doing a licensed activity they're just engaging in peaceful trade but there is the fear present. I think that's why it's so important that we have strong communities of like-minded individuals and we consider geographically concentrating around like-minded individuals like what they're doing up in the Free State Project. We're encouraging people to move here in Central Texas. So there really is strength in numbers. And I think if we can present a united front where we all just go ahead and live our lives according to our own ends as long as we don't harm anyone else, mm -hmm. then I think we'll be able to really pick up some momentum and make some real change, the kind of change that this country has never seen. John, amazing, amazing what you're doing. And again, the living example, I uh, not only applaud, but uh, encourage and will emulate many of the things you're doing as we travel around, too, and teach others, uh, you know, that the power to heal is theirs. That's a big part of this, and I know you're engaged in that. We're going to talk to uh, John on the other side of this break. We're going to keep on going this discussion. Those of you asked about the issue of sovereignty, there's no secret. It's just living as your birthright, I would say, demands, but we'll get into more of that. On the other side, it is also Outside the Box Wednesday, and we're going way outside the box, back into liberty here on the Robert Scott Bell Show with John. You know, many have asked me about eating organically grown foods. I started this back in the early 90s when I, I realized how corrupted our food supply had become and how ill I had become because of it. And people often ask, well, how did you do it? How did you, how did you start eating organically? I said, well, I started, you know, picking one thing instead of another. You know, it was one thing at a time. And in... In the sovereign movement, if we talk about that, it isn't about sovereign citizenship as well. That's a misnomer, misunderstood term. But it, it isn't about establishing a movement to overthrow anything. It's literally about reclaiming your heritage, your your, your birthright. Uh, it, it's literally about doing one thing differently each day. And who is 100% on this planet right now? It's, uh, it's, it's Jones, Alex Jones, the prison planet. I understand the reason why that term is, is could be it could be applicable here. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're talking with John Bush, by the way. And, and, John, as you are a living example here, you've got your new TV show hopefully going to be picked up here, SovereignLiving.tv. Uh, check it out. We've got the links up. Uh, we, we talked about the fear. A lot of people have fear and trepidation even discussing the issue because they don't want to be put on a list. Well, listen, got news for you. We're all on a list, as you've learned l recently, <laughs> with everybody being looked into everything for everything. Mm hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, everyone's on a list, even right from birth with the birth certificate and the Social Security number, which is a fraudulent system. It's like a Ponzi scheme, and then they're using the money to finance all sorts of debt and war. Uh, we don't want to have any part of it. It's it's a, it's a like an inverse relationship between people taking care of themselves, between multiple generations living on the property and communities coming together for mutual aid. As that goes down in society, there's an increase and government taking control of all this stuff and, and making multiple generations be dependent on the institution of government, which is financed entirely by coercion and fraud and printing money out of thin air. So, you know, a lot of times the inverse relationship is caused by government social engineering and coming in and breaking up families and injecting uh, propaganda in the minds of the youth of an entire nation for multiple generations now. Uh, but I think we can reverse the tide and people can go do the nullification thing and go fight in the political channels. I still see value in that. It's not for me. Mm -hmm. I feel if we only do that, then we're doing ourselves a disservice if we don't simultaneously build the alternatives and actually demonstrate that freedom really works. They both complement one another. John, but, John uh, if I, I might, think if we I can might. just move beyond that and start living free now, that's the yeah. real path. John, if I might, you know, that idea of, of following your bliss is what I picked up on. And, you know, I've said this because there, there's a lot of folks that – uh, will criticize, for instance, Rand Paul, Ron Paul's son, now in the Senate, for doing something that's different than what Ron Paul did. And, uh, you know, my perception is, that, listen, the guy's following his bliss. He's doing some good mm -hmm. within a system that I believe is is corruptible to the degree that I don't know that it's going to last, certainly not in, in its present incarnation. But whatever it is that you feel you can do, I will urge you to do. And that is, you know, you'll watch someone like John Bush, who we're talking to now, and the way he's living, you'll go, dude, I can never do that. But then others will be inspired to say, hey, I could do that. That's that's now accessible because I'm actually seeing it done, which is, to me, the importance of you know taking this project and putting it into the video realm of SovereignLiving.tv. Yeah, what we're trying to do with this Sovereign Living uh, reality-based program is educate, entertain, and inspire and show the ins and outs, the the mishaps, the difficulties, the stresses, and the accomplishments, the joy that comes with it, 
And essentially, it'll just be following Catherine and I and our two children, Aliana and William Lysander, as we try to become self-sufficient and lead a more voluntary, natural life. we got some great goals lined up for this year, too, that we're going to be tracking on the show. Uh, we're going to try to get 50% of the food that we eat from our property or from trade with local farms. We're going to try to reduce our energy dependency on the central energy system by 50% by reducing what we use by 20 25% and bringing on a 25% alternative energy, likely from solar. Uh, we're going to try to increase our chickens from, uh, well, what was like 70 whenever we started the project, uh, started recording the show. Now it's 100, but we're going to try to up that to 200. Uh, get some turkeys and ducks and stuff. So it's just going to follow us along as we go and see the ins and outs. And we hope to demonstrate that it doesn't take an expert, doesn't take millions of dollars. Normal people can do uh, abnormal, really exciting <laughs> things. And we hope people will, will follow along. You know, I can't, I can't emphasize uh, uh, the importance of, of what you're doing. And it's not uh, in any way to uh, make your head big because you're, you're just a good guy. And I like and appreciate respect you immensely. But this is taking the, the what we'll talk about on, in media and radio and bringing it to life for people. You know, I will often do that when I go out and speak and teach people how to heal, what to do, things like that. But the everyday, the little uh, nuts and bolts of living every day that seems such a foreign concept of how do you live free? You know, mm-hmm. isn't it a weird question to ask in America, the land of liberty, how do you live free? Really? Mm-hmm. And so the inspiration for this, I don't know where it came from, John, but I mean, I know you've been doing this for a while, but to have it captured in in a video format, I'm very excited about this. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, it's going to be great. We're working with Karmakazi Productions, and uh, they're really professional. Uh, The director that's behind it is really creative and has done a lot to help us uh, make sure we're capturing the story and the essence of of what sovereign living is all about. And there's even an element of the story that juxtaposes our our past of fighting the system and Mm -hmm. fighting hard to the point of exhaustion and still feeling defeated and not a bit freer to the to the evolution towards post political activism and just getting out there and, and living as free as we possibly can. So, yeah, I think it's going to inspire a lot of people. I think it's going to go uh, pretty pretty viral and be shared around, and we're hoping to reach as many people as possible uh, with this message. Well, you know we're going to pump it out here. Now, the issue of fighting, this is really a big one because many people have a, a righteous anger, a rightful anger about what's happened here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so the urge is with that anger is to direct it to I'm going to I'm going to beat somebody. I'm going to take them out. I'm going to do, you know, and there's a lot of folks even that kind of stimulate that action so they can go see. I told you so these people who want freedom, they're really just a violent bunch of of yahoos. We got to be careful for. And, you know, if I look at things like the art of war or, you know, if you follow a spiritual teaching or a path, whether it be one of the orthodox religions or whatever it is, you'll find somewhere in there this idea of of withdrawing that that energy from those who would use that energy against you, that it may be more efficient, in fact, instead of fighting, to simply not show up for the war, not show up for the fight, and suddenly it deflates what could have been a disaster and a bloodbath and starts making it a positive, uh, even a prolific movement that wasn't inspired by uh, the anger that might have might have stimulated initially the movement from where you are because it's so uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I've always held uh, to the idea that violence begins, begets violence, begets violence, begets violence. And yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, readings and teachings from Jesus Christ about loving your enemy. And uh, same thing with Gandhi and this practice of satyagraha and nonviolent revolution. And really, it's peaceful evolution. It's just history has shown time and time again, even the word revolution, if you look at the root of it, it's revolve, which is, which is nothing more than vicious cycles over and over, cycles going around, going around. And it's always the same thing because the crowd that takes control of the reins of power, they never seek to dissolve that power entirely, even when you leave a tiny little semblance of the power like supposedly happened with the U.S. Constitution, it's actually increased power that was enumerated to the central government, mm-hmm. uh, then it's always going to be exploited. It's inevitable. Whenever you have that institution, it's going to be sought after by those who wish to exploit others to further their own ends. And that's what we see with the American experience, and I'm, I hope we don't see that repeated through some sort of patriot uprising or revolution. I think it'd be great for there to be a, a contingent of libertarians, voluntarists, people that want to have a peaceful world that decide not to fight back 
not to say that you shouldn't defend yourself if your life is about to be gone because sure, self-preservation would, uh, is absolutely instinctual and natural yeah. and it's a moral thing to do. But I think it, there's a more value in creating a better system, doing it in a peaceful, open, public manner, and just starting over and, and helping to undermine the legitimacy of the present system. And they could just fall of their own accord because they're already out the door going down the, you know, the, the toilet anyway. Yes, yeah, and as a dad, you mentioned the, the right and obligation of, of, of defense. You know, it's not like we abandon the idea of defending our children or our families. Uh, but these things are not acts of aggression. They're acts of defense should they be become necessary and inevitable. But we also try to live our life so that we're not poking uh, the hornet's nest either. And, and it's an interesting thing I think I want to get into with you about this idea of sovereign living. Some people might perceive that, well, if you're living that way, you're poking the hornet's nest. But in, in many ways, it's not. It's withdrawing from that kind of behavior, is it not? Yeah, it, it is a withdrawal. It's a withdrawal of consent, a uh, withdrawal of participation. Uh, we ought to have the right to choose who we associate with. It's very natural of a phenomenon in the human experience. Uh, it shouldn't be forced upon us which institutions we are forced to participate in, what we're forced to fund. I'd like to see a nice little middle ground, and I think this is very reasonable and a conservative approach to a genuinely free society that we might be able to experience in our own lifetime, if not our children's lifetime or the next generations. But what if it was just, look, people that want to ha- organize and have a government, whether it's a democratic republic or even some sort of socialist government, you're free to do that. Just don't force it upon anyone else. And if you want to continue to have some sort of territorial monopoly or some geographic region that you operate under, only make those who don't want to participate pay for those services which they use. Like, I'll pay the gas tax for the roads. Maybe even I'll chip in for the public parks every once in a while because I go play frisbee golf with my younger brother. Sure. But I don't want to pay the centralized health system. I certainly don't want to pay for the war. I don't want to pay for the monopoly police that lock me up for free speech. Mm-hmm. So what if there's a little middle ground? I'll pay for the services that I use, but don't force me to pay for that which I find immoral or useless. Imagine that, use taxes. Well, we'll get into some more of that on the other side of this break. We're going to wrap up the hour with John. John Bush, SovereignLiving.tv, also host of Rise Up Radio, his show, uh, 7 a.m. Central Time, uh, Monday through Friday, and we have the links up through LRN.fm, and uh, here we are on Natural News Radio and all around the world, letting loose on a message of health, freedom, and healing liberty with John Bush. We'll be... Willing to go where the truth takes him. Here's Robert. Just talking to John on the break about kind of what we're doing. I'm thinking about it as we're doing it, talking about issues like sovereignty and sovereign living, and it really is demystifying. There's such a mystery surrounding it. I mean, that's the way uh, the old guard, the uh, the authoritarians would like you to believe that everybody that talks about this stuff is a terrorist in waiting as opposed to just people that want to live their lives, raise their family, care about you know other folks, and, and, and don't want to violate their rights. I love the fact that we can demystify this in this way, John. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a there's a bunch of veils and illusions taking place, and most of it came from the public schools. Kids are indoctrinated for twelve plus years. It's no surprise that. They don't understand that they own themselves and that they ought to be able to voluntarily participate in whatever lifestyle they so choose, as long as it doesn't interfere with anyone else, the law of equal liberty. But yeah, that's what it's all about, and and this show that we're putting together, Sovereign Living the Show, hopes to provide a living example of that, and people will find that we're normal you know, liberty loving, active people. We make mistakes. We're not perfect. It's fun. We we joke around and have a good time and we are on a pursuit of one hundred percent freedom, make no mistake about it. But there's no, no talk of overthrowing this or taking up arms against that. Mm-hmm. It's all just about peaceful interaction with one another. And I think once we put it in that context and, as you said, demystify it, uh, we're going to find that it's way popular and many people are going to be into it that never really thought about living free in that way. Totally. You know, that, that's the, the irony here is that it may be more dangerous to show people what it really is. You know, mm-hmm. that you're not dangerous. It's like, oh, no, we can't have people see that. No, they might they might like liberty. We don't want, you know, the whole idea also of, of the foundations for uh, the um, organic American Republic, if I can call it that, uh, you know, was rooted in this concept of liberty, the freedom to live your life as long as you didn't violate the rights of others in the process. And 
you know, yet the establishment of a constitution, a centralized bureaucracy, we were warned about what could happen, what would happen. But there are questions about, you know, hey, I wasn't a signatory to the compact. How, <laughs> how does it apply to me? You know, and even the states playing along in this way. That's why the nullification movement is growing. I respect Michael Bolden immensely in the 10th Amendment Center because their message is getting through. The consciousness, if I can call it that, is shifting as people say, you know, hey, I do have the right and maybe even the obligation to say no when what they're doing, their regulations are violating my rights to take care of my family. One of the biggest areas where we've talked about, you've had me on your show talking about it, is in health care, which, as you know, the government is not involved in. It's, in, it's vol- involved in monopolistic disease management. And now we got Obamacare almost fully implemented by 2014. How do you navigate those waters? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I mean... I would reject the idea that I should be forced to pay some fee or tax on top of the tax already uh, because I choose not to participate in the health insurance uh, allopathic Western medical system or whatever you call it, the disease management, the monopoly on (laughs) disease management. Uh, You know, the way that I see it is I don't want to subsidize someone's poor health choices. The mass of Americans have very terrible diets, all processed foods, fast food, McDonald's, they're pounding sugar like it's freaking cocaine. (laughs) And here I am doing everything I can on limited means Mm -hmm. to provide my family with organic non-GMO food and to seek natural health treatments and natural remedies. And and sometimes it's not the the cheapest thing to do. So why should I, who's trying to take care of myself, trying to take care of my family and do it in a natural way, be forced to pay for someone's nasty habits when they're doing it to themselves and they're the ones that are creating an environment in America in addition to the bureaucrats and the monopoly system uh, where there is a healthcare epidemic. So I would hope people would stand up loud and proud and embrace natural health remedies, naturopathy, holistic medicine, homeopathy, and uh, stand proud and say, no, we're we're not going to fund other people's terrible health decisions. Live, live by example. That's the way that you can solve the health care crisis. Live by example. Well, some would argue that, well, there's, there's, again, coming back to now, moving from individual responsibility to some sort of collective responsibility. Now, you mentioned the word community. Listen, we got to acknowledge there are communities. We'd like to get com- people together in communities that actually understand these concepts. But what is this? How do you make peace with those that say you have a responsibility to pay for those who are less fortunate than you, who are, who don't know about organics or can't afford good food. And, you know, these are the kind of arguments that seemingly go nowhere, but there's a way I guess we can be living examples to that. Yeah, and for people that say that, the first thing I ask is, oh, so what are you doing to help low-income families with their health care? Are, are you volunteering? Are you going door-to-door helping them? Are you linking them up with natural health care professionals? And most often than not, they're doing nothing but voting and encouraging other people to steal from one another in, in order to fund someone's health care decisions. So what I like to do and what we're doing through the Center for Natural Living, uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit with the mission of demonstrating the value of voluntary cooperation and natural living in the areas of sustainability, family, and health by creating educational media and helping families to fulfill their basic needs, is we're going to do just that. We're going to go out to low-income neighborhoods. We're going to survey the entire community and find out where there's a void in knowledge when it comes to these issues and this information. And we're going to go put on health education seminars. We're also going to find families and individuals that are looking to get into natural health care but may not have the means to afford it. And we're going to help subsidize that. And we're going to hook them up with uh, natural supplements and vitamin regimens. And we're going to demonstrate that we can do a lot more good for those in need by peacefully cooperating with one another through philanthropic endeavors rather than through coercive monopolies that do nothing more than keep people sick and fill the pockets of the big health care uh, industry. Well, I see that those that have understood this and, and starting to apply it, like going into inner cities that are very, let's say, economically challenged and starting teaching these folks how to start their own gardens and grow yeah. their own foods, which is better than Bernanke's method of printing your own money. Growing your own food is printing your own money. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. It, and exactly that. We have a uh, 
about 100 chickens right now. Probably only about 50 or 60 of them are active layers. Mm-hmm. And we have, you know, several dozen eggs a day. It's way more than our family eats, even though we have like 10 for breakfast every day. But uh, the excess we use to trade, we, we're bringing back a dime a dozen. We trade a silver dime for a dozen of eggs. It's worth like 2 or $3 right now or four FRNs. Yes. Uh, the, our, our baby photos for our newborn, William Lysander, we traded a, a chicken that I slaughtered that a family ate and uh, two or three dozen eggs for a, a nice $100 photo session. So it's great to actually run the printing press in your own backyard. And anybody that has any skills or talents or can grow tomatoes or jalapenos or can do plumbing or can make T-shirts or quilts, uh, it's always important to get out there. You have the ability to create your own money out of the value that is implicit in your trade. And I think it's really a uh, excellent thing to do towards sovereign living to circumvent the use of the monopoly money and go ahead and create these alternative institutions and, and build value amongst ourselves and our communities. Well, we see that in every aspect of life. Those that control the inter- interface, if you will, or the inter- inter- exchange. They they literally have convinced us that what you're doing is not possible. Can't happen. Don't even think about it. Don't look at John Bush. Don't look at his family. But I'm telling you, watch the man. He's willing to put his life out there with his family to teach others. And it's a great act of, I would say, in some way, sacrifice. But probably it brings you great joy, I have to assume, that you're able to inspire others in this way. And as you said, you're putting your energy, your efforts, your labor into this by going out and actually helping folks in need as opposed to just saying, well, I voted. That's all I need to do. And somebody else, you know, will steal some money. We'll take most of it and you'll never see it again. But here's a penny left over. We'll we'll throw it out there and do something like give a drug or a vaccine, which has nothing Mm -hmm. in reality to do with promoting good health. Yeah, for sure. And that's why I feel uh, confident and secure, even though there is a big monopoly mafia system. I think it's important that if we're living good lives and if we're demonstrating that you know we're inherently good people that are trying to help those that are in need, it kind of acts as an insurance. And it's my hope, at least, maybe it's naive of me, <laughs> that uh, if we can do enough good, then we can turn the tide. We could change the way people believe and, and think about how we ought to organize society. And we could demonstrate the efficacy of, of organizing peacefully and voluntarily. And uh, the state will just continue to whittle away because as they crack down, if they crack down on people like me or people uh, like uh, Hirschberger up mm-hmm. in Wisconsin, I believe, or Minnesota, right. who was doing the raw milk community, uh, the CSA operation, it only serves to undermine their legitimacy. And, and that's what we need it, as trying to create a free society. We need more people. People to realize that government is nothing more than a, a mafia that has the semblance of, of legitimacy and it makes them the most dangerous criminal syndicate in civilization. Yeah, and what makes each and every one of you dangerous is when you wake up and recognize that their permission is not required. It's never been required. We were just kind of duped. And if you have a sense of, yeah, I know something's up, but I don't know what to do about it, and you'd like to do something that will actually make a difference, hey, watch John Bush and family. SovereignLiving.tv, front slash the show, will get you there. You can take a look at it. I also have a link to what they call the sizzle reel, so you get a sense of it. Also, listen, RiseUpRadio.com, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Eastern Time. And, John, man, I always feel better when I'm hanging out with you, even if it's for a short time. Right on, RSB. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're hoping people can contribute to make uh, Sovereign Living a reality, We've pun intended. We've recorded the first three episodes. We still have nine to go, so we're hoping that people can contribute to our Kickstarter-like crowdsourcing campaign that can be found at SovereignLiving.tv slash the show and, and help us put this into full production and get it out to the masses. Hey, this is a way you can actually make a difference. Even if you're not on the show, you can support the making of it. And, uh, John, any special parting gifts? <laughs> <laughs> well, a twenty dollar donation gets you a sneak peek of the full season before it's released to the public. Forty dollars, you get a DVD and a T-shirt of the full season. Mm-hmm. A hundred dollar donation, you get your name in the credits. A two hundred dollar donation, you get to three, you get to name three bunny rabbits that we're going to have here on the property. Thousand dollars, you get to name a goat. Twenty five hundred dollars, we'll fly out to your city and put on a sneak peek screening of episodes one through three. And for five thousand dollars, we'll fly out, put out a sneak 
peak screening and also put on a full-blown educational conference, which I think would be pretty exciting for someone to take advantage of that. There's also opportunities for you to announce your business organization or cause Mm -hmm. in a commercial style thing for the show. Uh, There's a bunch of different spots, so you could be featured on as little as one or the full season of episodes. I think it's a great way to get someone's message out there to a really uh, direct audience that's going to be really into this. And We need everyone's support to actually get it out there. We got the first three episodes almost fully done. We want to do an entire 12 episodes and really paint the entire picture, the ins and outs, the ups and downs about what sovereign living is all about. Well, dig those parting gifts and totally dig John Bush and his efforts. And anytime we can get together, you have, a, you know, uh, the doors wide open, you know, here on the Robert Scott Dole Show. So, John, thank you for being here and uh, look forward to following up. I can't wait to see the episodes uh, myself as well. And uh, thanks for demystifying sovereign living. All right, on Robert. Thanks for having me, and thanks for always being an inspiration on uh, living a more natural, healthy life. Absolutely.